Customer's Pet. Hey everybody, we're back. Everything is still super chaotic and confusing schedule-wise, but what else would you expect from people who can't read the calendar? So, Misfits is back. We got an episode for you today. Pastor Joel is joining us again. He just can't get enough of us, apparently. And today, though, we are not talking to Pastor Joel. We are instead talking to Joel Bowman Sr., MSW, LCSW. Because today we are finally able to finally have the discussion that we advertised like three months ago. Um, we're, we are going to dive in today and pick Joel's brain as far as what mental health actually looks like from a Christian perspective. Because this is something that gets, the, the terms get thrown around all the time. It gets debated all the time, and most of the time the people talking about it or debating it don't actually know anything about it. So today we're going to actually talk to a mental health professional who also happens to be a theologian and a pastor and um, and everything like that. So Joel, welcome back for like the fifth time, third time, something like that, you know. Good um, to be here, man. Yeah, and you are enjoying your your fall. Because for those that are not watching, Joel is out sunbathing while we're doing all of this on his deck. Meanwhile, I'm freezing in my studio because I forgot to turn the heater on. So, Joel, you're here. You let, Let's just start with what it actually means that you are a mental health professional. Because that's something that people can claim all they want as well. And people do, but they may not actually mm-hmm. be. So when we talk about the fact that you are a mental health professional, what does that actually mean? So to segue into the answer to your question, Andrew, I would simply say that first and foremost, we need to define mental health. Yes. All right. And mental health, according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, includes our emotional, psychological and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel and act and helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others and make choices. And so, therefore, a mental health professional is one who has been trained to address these various issues, one who has been degreed, one who has been credentialed to help individuals who are struggling with various forms of mental illness or various forms of maladjustment. So a person may not necessarily have a severe and chronic mental illness but perhaps they're going through a life crisis. A mental health professional then would be one who has been academically trained to address the issues related to our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. And I just want to really put my weight on that. These are individuals who have been trained academically. These are individuals who've had to go through internships or field placements Mm -hmm. And these are also individuals who have been credentialed in their particular state as it relates to mental health treatment. And that's why the letters I threw on matter so much. So for those that don't Mm -hmm. know what these letters mean, MSW is Master of Social Work, which is is the degree part of it. And that's what that's what Joel has. That's what my wife is getting right now. Um, that, that's what we're dealing with. And so this is something that most people don't realize necessarily is the fact that social work is a mental health profession. It is not just a sociology profession. It is a mental health profession that also deals with sociology and policy and everything else. Yeah. One of my former supervisors said it this way, Andrew, that social work is the Velcro profession meaning that so many different things stick to it. So if you want to be a mental health professional and provide therapy to individuals, social work is an excellent degree to get. That is at least at the master's level. If you want to deal with social policy, if you want to work in child welfare and things of that sort, social work is excellent. Now, 
in all fairness to our brothers and sisters in other disciplines, there's psychology, there is professional counseling, mm -hmm. there are licensed marriage and family therapists. And so there are different degrees that you can get that will position you to be a mental health professional. Mm -hmm. Social work is just one of those. Of course, it's my favorite, obviously, <laughs> as I've had this particular degree, MSW, for 31 years. 31 years. So yeah. For I those guess I that want I was about five years old when I got this degree. No, I'm sorry. Right. I was going to say, cause for those that want uh, want to really put that into to focus, when my wife and I were talking to him about some of my wife's homework stuff and everything like that, Joel responded to us with, oh, yeah, I think I did that one on a typewriter. Um, so right. if, if, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, and part of what he just said there is also, so those of you that have been listening all the way back to season one, we have had mental health professionals on the show talking about counseling and things before, specifically with the McDowell family, Angela McDowell is a licensed marriage and family therapist. Mm -hmm. That's different than, men, than a social worker, but mm -hmm. it is a lot of overlapping with the fields in terms a of a lot of overlap like that you know dwight yeah. mcdowell is not one of those but he is a marriage and family therapist that has gone through certifications and things like that there's different mm -hmm. levels all with the same goal though of the well-being of the person that they are working with exactly now the other set of letters you have is the mm -hmm. lcsw and mm -hmm. that is what gives you the ability to actually do the work there within Kentucky, correct? That is correct. LCSW stands for Licensed Clinical Social Worker. So this is why Joel is here today. We've already established the fact that the man has an extensive theological knowledge and that he is grounded theologically, Christocentric theology, all of it. So we need to hold that in. We need to keep that in mind, but also recognize the fact that today he is here, though, to talk about the other side of all of his work, which is on the mental mm -hmm. health side. And part of why we went through all of that is because of the fact, like we said, mental health is a very touchy topic. And if it's not talked about well, it actually mm -hmm. has the effect of harming mental health just by talking about it wrong. That's so, well said. Well said, Andrew. <laughs> so today we're going to focus in on mental health and Christianity specifically. So the first question I've got for you, Joel, is actually a much broader question of what do you see as the perception of the mental health topic within the U.S. as a whole? So not Christianity, not the church, not within the professional world, just as America as a whole, what is our perception of mental health? Well, I would say that we've come a long way. I've been practicing in this field long enough to have seen kind of a shift in terms of people's comfort in America about talking relative to mental health concerns or mental illness. And so we have in fact come a long way. However, there is still a stigma as it pertains to mental illness. And oftentimes because of people's own baggage, they automatically assume that if you engage a mental health professional and you contract with them to help you that that makes you crazy or cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs or whatever. And we have all of these negative derogatory terms that relate to people with chronic persistent mental illness. And so some of that obviously is still there, but we have in fact come a long way in certain segments of our society. It's actually, it's actually seen as chic to pursue mental health treatment, okay? And typically that is within the higher socioeconomic brackets. Mm -hmm. But even now, across socioeconomic lines, there is still a stigma as it relates to talking about mental health or mental illness. Well, and part of what you just said there is also part of the difference between why, you know, just knowing you in general, I would assume this is the case and you can tell me I'm completely wrong here once I finish. But, okay. you know, part of what you're talking about, though, is part of why, you know, people with the heart that you have, 
and people like my wife who have the, a similar calling, similar heart, why the social work side is such an important piece to the mental health picture is that there the stigma changes based off the socioeconomic level. And even in a lot of cases, like you, you did an entire episode with good friend, Dr. Brian Hudson, even mm-hmm. on a racial level, you have right. the stigma changes and the economic changes. And so it, This is part of why I know, especially for my wife, the difference between she started taking classes within counseling, just counseling Mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. And then when she switched to social work, she found that that was much more of what she was actually interested in because it wasn't just we're going to deal with your mental health, but it was we're going to deal with your mental health in a way that is tailored to what it is that you actually have. And what it is, yes, that and also in, in a manner that is holistic. And so, yes. one of the things that attracted me to the social work profession is that even 31, 35 years ago, around the time that I started, social work was a long established profession within mental health and within social services that was really focused on looking at people holistically. So, most of us who have been to undergraduate school are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we know that the most basic fundamental needs have to do with food, clothing, and shelter. And so one of the things I've been trained to do as a clinical social worker is to look at how is it that having housing insecurity and economic challenges can have a direct impact on a person's mental health and wellness. Whereas, for instance, with psychology, psychology tends to be focused on the individual, tends to be focused exclusively on the mind. But social work, what makes it unique is that it very much is a holistic approach to dealing with human wellness. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why I've really been uh my uh, my earbud fell out. That's one of the reasons why I've really been attracted to to this field. Yeah, and actually, you, you've kind of already started the process of segueing into the next question I had for you anyway, which is the perception within, the, within American Christianity. Because like you said, mm-hmm. there's a lot of these different fields and things that cover it, such as things like psychology mm-hmm. and, and things like that. And the difference between a holistic approach and a, and a philosophical approach and all these different things. This is part of where we get into the problems with when we hear Christians talking about mental health. Mm -hmm. What is the actual perception of mental health within American Christianity, would you say? I would say that whenever America catches a cold, the church or Christianity writ large has pneumonia. And so I use that (laughs) analogy simply to say that the church, the body of Christ is lagging behind in terms of the comfortability with the topic of mental health, with the whole idea of pursuing professional mental health counseling or therapy. And so if there's still a stigma in society as a whole, I would say that the stigma, the stigma rather is even greater within Christianity. And it has to do with a lot of our theological and cultural baggage as it pertains to the secular fields that train in mental health, right? There is this belief, particularly within more conservative evangelical and fundamentalist uh, segments of the church that, you know, the Bible is all sufficient. It's all that we need and any quote unquote, worldly training or worldly systems of thought have nothing to offer the church. And so we need to counsel people strictly from a biblical perspective and that's it. Well, here's where the problem lies. If you were to ask the same person, if they have a primary care physician or a primary care provider, chances are they would say yes, or at the very least they have someone to whom they could go if there were a medical issue, if there were was an issue related to their physical health. They would have no problem going to see a doctor if they had, let's say, a diagnosis of diabetes. 
they would have no problem taking metformin or insulin if they uh, were indicated as being one that could benefit from those particular medications. But yet and still when it comes to mental health and wellness, then they say, well, the Bible is all we need. Well, if, you, if you've got a broken leg, right, or if you have gotten a severe laceration or cut from a car accident, you're not going to say, well, the Bible is all I need. You're going to go to the ER, you're going to go to a medical professional, and you're going to seek treatment. Hmm. And what I'm saying is, is that the same thing ought to be true as it relates to mental health and wellness. If I'm having a, a challenge with mental illness, if I am struggling with clinical depression, which is something that I've personally struggled with in the past, um, then I'm going to seek someone who has been professionally trained to address that issue. Now, would it be great if that person was a Christian? It would be awesome uh, to be able to go to a brother or sister in Christ who's trained in that area. However, it's not absolutely necessary depending upon the specific issues with which I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. Does that make yeah, sense? And, oh, yeah. And that and this is part of where, you know, we have to start breaking down what we're actually talking about a little bit more. Because part of the issue that we hear is people saying, well, we can't trust, insert whatever field here, psychology, right. uh, you know, philosophy, you know, all these different things. Right. Historically, though when we actually start looking at some of these different things, a lot of these fields actually were pioneered in many ways right. by the church. Yeah. Yeah. Because of yep. what you talked about before, as far as the fact that, you know, Imago Dei holistic care is what the church is supposed to be about. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, yeah. Social work has distinctively Christian roots. Right. Right. So that, that's now, a, you may yeah. not necessarily see those roots in your academic training all of the time. However, as a Christian who is an integrationist, I've come to really appreciate the uh, rooting that social work has in the church. You know, you had settlement houses and the like. You had individuals who saw it as their mission to help people holistically through the vocation of social work. And so, yeah, I think that what we've got to do is we've got to look at the fact that all truth is God's truth. Mm -hmm. And so do I believe that the Bible is the word of God? Absolutely. I am an inerrantist. That means that I believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. I believe it's infallible. I believe it's inspired. All of those good things, right, related to Bebbington's quadrilateral, all those things related to what uh, evangelicals would say are, are critical issues for them as it pertains to scripture. However, I also understand that God has called us to live in a community. We live among people, we live among other human beings, and God has, by his common grace, allowed human beings to go and get training in certain key areas, whether it's medicine, whether it's law, whether it's mental health, whatever it is, God has enabled human beings, whether they are Christian or not, to go and get trained in various areas that can be of practical assistance to us as human beings, whether we're Christian or not. So I think what happens a lot of times, particularly in more conservative or evangelical circles, is that we tend to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We, we basically say, well, it's all worldly. We can't use any of it. You know, just stick with the Bible. But how does that work if you have cancer? You know, how does that work if you have lupus? And so we need to take the same approach as it relates to mental health and well-being. So I guess the the question, we may not even have an answer for it today. I don't know. It would be, what, where did this start as far as when, I guess, is actually but when did this start? When did we suddenly decide that because of the fact that there are all these things that potentially look worldly mm -hmm. means that we just have to just get rid of all of it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my initial thought would be we're looking at the 1920s, but I don't know right. if, if in terms of what, you know, 
the work you've done and everything like that, if if you've seen a much more distinct pattern that has developed, or mm -hmm. if this is something that has been it's been brewing for a long time. Yeah. So I believe you're referring to kind of like the uh, fundamentalist modernist right. uh, dichotomy that had arisen. And uh, there was a movement in the church, particularly evangelical and fundamental fundamentalist spaces to basically say anything that, quote unquote, looks worldly, we need to do away with it. Um, and with every move that happens in the church, I think that sometimes the pendulum swings too far to the other side. Right. Mm -hmm. um, was there in the earlier part of the 20th century a devaluing of scripture? A, a lowering of how people saw scripture? Uh, absolutely so. Uh, but yet and still, that does not mean that the secular fields don't have anything to offer to us. Because I, I'm a firm believer in God's common grace. You know, Jesus says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And so having said that, uh, there are various things uh, that are for our benefit in terms of our overall health and well-being that may in fact come from someone who's not saved, right? And, you know, the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us gives us discernment uh, in terms of how to determine, you know, what's congruent with our faith and what is totally antithetical to our faith. And so, you know, we've got to understand that things are not always so black and white. There are there are shades of gray. Uh, there are areas of nuance that we need to be aware of as it pertains to how we look at mental health. And and I used the term integrationist before, and and I've been using that term essentially for all 31 years post grad uh, that I've been uh, practicing social work because I was uh, given the benefit of being plugged in from the very beginning being plugged into a, a, a community of Christians and social work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've previously been affiliated with the North American Association of Christians and Social Work. In fact, at one point in the mid nineties, I was on their board of directors. And so I was, I was raised in this field around a diversity of Christians, uh, many of whom had a high view of scripture, just like me, and they saw that it would be very much possible to integrate the Christian faith with various disciplines and various philosophies of practice that did not directly contradict scripture, right? And so I, I commonly refer to myself as an integrationist. Now, now mind you, uh, there's a movement within evangelicalism that says that integrationism is wrong, you ought not do it, that all people that want to do counseling within the body of Christ, they need to be trained to focus exclusively on the Bible and not to depart from it. And, and it's the I same think, discussion yeah. we've had. And I, we, you know, you and I have had it on the phone, but we've also had it, mm -hmm. you know, here in studio. And so as far as it's the exact same discussion that we have whenever CRT is brought up, it's the same mm -hmm. discussion whenever any type of community outreach is brought up. When we mm -hmm. even when um, those of you that listen that were involved with the episode we did with Dr. Linville talking the Celtic way of evangelism, all of these sort of things are now looked at as a. I don't know if you've got a better word for it. Where it, they're they're treated as if it is a taboo. poison, yeah, a taboo yeah. or a poisoning of the water, basically of a yeah, if a poisoning of the water is a, a good way to put it. Yeah, start down this road. Where are we going to stop? It's the slippery so slope fallacy. <laughs> Yeah. Now, now the issue with CRT, I would say, is a bit different. I think a lot of the resistance in the church against CRT is simply because a lot of Christians are racist. Right. I mean, I, I'll just cut across the field. Well, and, and, and I say would that. say I would say that a lot of even this the stuff that we're talking about today, as far as the tabooness of mental health and everything, is coming from the same heart. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a they do not look like us. They don't right. think xenophobia. Like us. It, it's it's fear based, fear based, fear based. And especially and, when we're when we're talking about what you just said, as far as the fact that you have fallen in love with this field largely because of your love for scripture, 
That's right. The question then comes in, what does scripture actually tell us about mental health? Because this is, again, where we get into a lot of very heated discussions in a mm. lot of places. Right, right. What, what do we actually, what does the Bible actually give us related to mental health? Right. Well, I've got several things, but first and foremost, we need to understand the nuance and the complexities of the conversation. So uh, the Bible does not utilize the term mental health or mental illness. Just like, for instance, you know, uh, when I have debated with Jehovah's Witnesses, which most of us would consider to be a cult group, they'll say, now you see the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Okay, obviously, you look in your concordance and you don't see the word Trinity in the Bible. However, the concept of the Godhead or the Trinity is, is specifically addressed in Scripture. So we, we have to, uh, in our hermeneutic, uh, learn how to look at Scripture conceptually. So um, the uh, term mental health or mental illness is not in Scripture. However, I do think that there are some principles and there are some concepts that really lend themselves well in terms of how we understand the human person. Um, and, and one scripture that I go to is 1 Thessalonians 5.23, uh, in which Paul says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So even in that particular scripture, long before um, all of the mental health research had been done, long before we had all of these mental health related disciplines, the Holy Spirit had inspired Paul to the extent that he understood the human person holistically mm -hmm. because he talks about the whole spirit, soul, and body. And so all of us as human beings have been created in the image of God, Imago Dei, um, and we have been created uh, to be tripart beings. We have a spirit and we have a soul which live in our body. And so I think where we need to start as it relates to understanding mental health or mental illness for that matter, is that we need to start with what, how does the Bible describe us as human beings? What are the very various parts of our human person? Uh, well, and certainly, you, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, what you even said, you know, for those that are, because we've, all, we've talked multiple times in different areas as far as the fact is how much First Thessalonians 5 is ignored outside of when they want to talk rapture. Right. But that concept is not exclusive to First Thessalonians 5, because we see it in the Old Testament when we talk about Samuel. Samuel grew in wisdom and stature and spirit. Jesus. Same with Jesus. In, in, in wisdom Luke and stature and favor. So yep. this is nothing that should be new for anybody that has read either section of Scripture. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And so this is how I conceptualize uh, mental illness. Now, uh, do mental illnesses necessarily have a direct correlation to sin in a person's life? No. Uh, in fact, in, in, in most cases, I would say, when we talk about mental illness, we need to talk about it from a medical perspective right. or from a mental health treatment perspective. So all illnesses find their origin in the fall in Genesis three. So, you know, whether it's some type of physical illness or mental illness, we know that we would not have any of these illnesses without the fall of Adam. So we get that. But does that necessarily mean that there is a direct correlation between a person's mental health and their spiritual condition? And the answer would be no. Uh, for instance, in my family, there is a genetic linkage to mental illness, specifically depression. You know, we've got some people in my family deal with bipolar depression. Other people like myself, we deal with unipolar depression or, or the typical clinical depression that does not have the extreme highs and lows, right? And so, so I take medication 
because there was a chemical imbalance in my brain, okay? That did not have anything to do with a particular sin in my life, a particular uh, besetting habit in my life. It had to do with a natural result of the fall, and that is we as human beings are born into a fallen world our bodies are decaying every day. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that all of us have in common is that uh, we're getting older with each passing day and we are exposed to various illnesses. And many of those illnesses have a genetic basis to them. Many of those illnesses have a medical basis to them. And so therefore they have to be addressed as such. And Uh, Speaking of mental illness, let me go ahead and give you this definition of mental illness from the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Mental illnesses are medical conditions that disrupt a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others, and daily functioning. Just as diabetes is a disorder of the pancreas, mental illnesses are medical conditions that often result in a diminished capacity for coping with the ordinary demands of life. And so we've got to get out of this mindset of thinking that everything that happens in a person's life that's bad is specifically connected to a particular sin. In fact, you see that in the gospels, how you know there was this assumption in society that if a person had leprosy, if a person had various ailments, that it was because of a sin that they had in their life. If you look at, for instance, Job's friends in the Old Testament, they automatically made the assumption that because Job was was losing his family and his possessions and his health, that that related to a specific sin in his life. That is not necessarily the case. And and we must understand... Right, right. You know, it's interesting how some of the same individuals criticize prosperity theology. Um, Many of what many of the things (laughs) that they address are rooted in prosperity theology because they they basically say, well, if you have enough faith, you shouldn't struggle with depression. If you have enough faith, you shouldn't have panic attacks. and, And part of what and, you know, this is where, you know. I have always actually connected in some ways when we're talking holistic as far as how mental health does actually connect with the spiritual health is that it's not a matter of your sin is what is causing a mental illness, but your mental Mm -hmm. illness will have an effect on your spiritual health. It is either going to cause you to have doubt, which is sometimes healthy. Mm -hmm. And so that's not a sin either. Or, in many cases... You mean doubt is not a sin? I know. Shocker. But, you know, the... the In many cases, and this is what we see in those stories you just talked about out of the Gospels, is that many of the people that struggle mm-hmm. with these sort of things, their faith is what actually keeps them going. It's not that they have less faith and so they have mental right. illness. It's that their mental illness, it, this is what Paul talks about in uh, right. Second Corinthians. You know, three times I asked for deliverance and the Lord said, my, fa- my grace is sufficient for you. Yes. So, so, so many of us have a proverbial thorn in the flesh. Right. And for some of us, that thorn in the flesh could be an autoimmune illness like lupus. For instance, I have a, a sister whom I pastor at our church who has lupus. She has a lot of faith. She loves the Lord. Um, she's prayed on numerous occasions for God to heal her of that. Uh, but on each of those occasions, essentially, God's my grace mission, right? And there are other individuals within the church that may have a thorn in the flesh uh, called depression, right? And the very fact that they've done as well coping with depression depression is really a testament to faith in Christ. Right. Uh, the fact that a person uh, is cognizant enough of their situation to take their medication on a regular basis, to make sure they check in with their psychiatric prescriber, uh, that can be an evidence of faith. You know, so we, we've, got, we've got to, I think, um, define the term faith holistically uh, right. that you know faith is not 
necessarily the ability to pray and the illness miraculously is taken away. Faith sometimes is the wherewithal and the perseverance to submit treatment that has been prescribed. So, you know, this is what Brian and I were talking about a few weeks ago when we were walking through the episode on faith, was that faith mm -hmm. is the, the, the knowing that what we believe in will happen. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen in this world. The healing may come after we have gone. Mm -hmm. But we know and are confident that it will mm -hmm. come. And so that means that we can deal with the thorns here. It doesn't mean that it's pleasant. It doesn't mean that we want to. Mm -hmm. But the faith is what will allow us to go. This is what we see with the blind man in, in John 9. The apostles all assumed somebody in the family had sinned, and so this guy has no faith, and so that's why he's blind. But that story shows that that man had faith before Jesus had even healed him. And he didn't even know who it was that was going to heal him. He just knew that God would allow mm -hmm. him to see at some point. And he wanted everybody to know who it was that did it, even at the risk of losing everything he just gained. You know, that is what we're talking about when mm -hmm. we talk about faith related to this sort of thing. It's not... This, this is why it's so important for us to have this discussion with people that actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> because we, we, when we try to over-theologize, suddenly sin enters the picture automatically, and it's either right. not a sin, and so we don't need to deal with it at all, or it's such a sin that we don't need to deal with it at all because we don't want to be associated with it. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, me mental health is just another area in which the church is able to show the grace of God on this earth. Amen. Amen. So why do we actually have this disconnect, Joel? Why is there this disconnect between what the Bible actually says and what Christian culture has mm -hmm. been teaching? Why is, where did this disconnect start? I think that this disconnect is both theological and cultural in its basis. And so what I mean by that is that the average Christian knows how to do hermeneutics or Bible interpretation effectively and appropriately. We've got to understand that technically speaking, none of the Bible was written to us, right? but all of the Bible was written for us. And so what that means is, for instance, when I read a passage out of 1 Corinthians, I have to understand well, what were the particular issues that Paul was addressing with the church at Corinth? What was the historical context, right? And so I think what happens a lot of times is people will take the leap from Jerusalem to America too quickly without really sitting with what did this text mean and how did this text apply to the original readers, right? Mm -hmm. And once you have grappled with that issue, you are then able to then apply scripture to our current day. Uh, because the day in which we live from a cultural perspective is much different from the days in which Paul lived or Peter right. or Mary or Martha. And so part of it has to do with some faulty theology or some faulty hermeneutics, some faulty approaches in how we um, interpret scripture. And, and the other piece has to do with the cultural baggage because a lot of things become codified in our church experience, in our Christian life, and they're culturally based. Mm -hmm. it, it's because that's the tradition with we were raised. And so, we got to understand that not everything we have come to believe is necessarily biblical. It could be cultural based upon what a pastor taught us, based upon what we were raised with. And so we need to, I think, uh, take a more serious, nuanced approach in terms of how do we apply 
the principles of scripture to the common everyday problem of mental illness. And, and that comes when we uh, divest ourselves of logical and cultural baggage that can cause us to have a skewed view of the same. So with all of that in mind, as far as the fact we've got all of these different different things going on in terms of the culture between what scripture actually is telling us to do, all these different things, which for most people that have listened to anything that we have done, you should know this is nothing exclusively different about so mental health compared to anything else. Because the majority of the stuff that we talk about is the fact that culture has dictated how the church responds yep. rather than what scripture actually is saying. This is just another example of the mm -hmm. fact of what we're dealing with. Just but the question thing. then is, what should a Christian approach to mental health actually look like? Because like you said, Scripture has already said holistic health is a thing. And it's an important thing. And it's part mm -hmm. of how God has designed us as far as Imago Dei is concerned. So mm -hmm. how should we actually approach mental health from a Christian perspective. We'll start just mental health in general, as far as the things we talked about, the stigmas and everything. How do we actually, how should we actually be approaching it? Well, I, I think fundamentally, uh, we should be approaching it the same way that we've been describing heretofore in our discussion, that just like there are medical illnesses just like there are physical health concerns, there are mental health concerns that oftentimes require professional intervention. Now, with that being said, there are levels of severity. So right. there are a number of people who I pastor who they don't have a diagnosable mental health disorder, but they may be going through a life adjustment issue that requires pastoral counseling, right? So in, in that context, um, you know, maybe the practical application of certain scriptures uh, will be just what the doctor ordered, as it were. Um, but when we're talking about mental illness, we're talking about a medical condition that requires medical intervention. And so I think, um, the issue for us in terms of what Christian mental health looks like is that we need to look at the whole spectrum of severity. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a person could just be simply having uh, everyday uh, simple grief. Perhaps, you know, I've just lost my mother and I need a church elder or a church leader or a brother or sister in Christ to give me a word of comfort. OK, maybe that's all I need. Um, you know, and, and the church would be totally sufficient in that regard. However, uh, let's say that I'm dealing with more complex grief that is more far reaching and more severe and more persistent. Then in that case, uh, I may need, let's say, a grief and loss support group uh, in conjunction with professional counseling and therapy. So I, I think I think the the trick of it is is determining uh, based upon the level of severity that you are experiencing life difficulties in is uh, what level of care will you need? There are levels of care, uh, and I think what the church can do, what every local church ought to do, is to identify mental health professionals within them if they happen to have mm -hmm. a mental health professional uh, or to contract with a mental health professional outside of the church to consult with them in terms of how do you do um, triage on people, right? Uh, because like at the end of the sermon at Temple of Faith, we will have an invitation for people to respond to the message. And, you know, some people respond by you know, surrendering their lives to Christ uh, by placing their faith in Christ and making that profession public. Uh, but then other people may come forward and they may be experiencing life difficulties to the extent that they're having issues with mental illness. And so therefore, 
uh, I have trained our uh, late counselors, our late decision counselors to ascertain what level of care that person needs. And if that person needs something that is more professionally based, uh, then we have a system whereby we can make referrals. And, you know, the interesting piece is that even though I'm a pastor that happens to be a mental health professional, within the context of my church, I make it clear that I am not functioning as a mental health professional. I am not mm -hmm. functioning as our church therapist. And so uh, I actually end up referring individuals outside of the church to get help. Even though I'm professionally trained to deal with certain issues, it is not appropriate for me in that context to, to provide clinical care because that is and that's not where, the role. And that's where we actually need to, we'll just go ahead and jump right in. Cause this is where, again, the discussion gets very heated is mm -hmm. that beyond just the level of severity, you have the different <clears throat> levels of care on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. this is, and again, this is where it gets, gets very, very complex and very, very, very heated very quickly. Because there are mm -hmm. multiple different options. You already mentioned professional care. Mm -hmm. You didn't necessarily use the wording before, but you talked about secular care in terms of completely outside of the church altogether, not even a Christian right. that's doing the counseling. You, mm -hmm. You've talked about pastoral counseling. That's another. And then pastoral. the other one that you didn't use, and I'm going to mm -hmm. have you say it because every time I try to say it, it's pronounced wrong. And if I try to type it out, my computer thinks I'm talking ancient history instead. The other one um, that gets used all the time is uh, starts with an N. Newthetic. Newthetic. There we go. I mm -hmm. yeah. For those mm -hmm. that want to know what I was referring to, every time I try to type it out, it my phone and my computer change it to Neolithic. So <laughs> um, yeah, newthetic counseling, all that. Those are the main ones that we see, at least within a church church capacity, as far as what is talked about. There are others, and right. we've talked about them before: psychology, marriage and family therapy. Which, if you mm -hmm. are looking for marriage and th family therapy, let me know. We'll connect you with our friends over at Marriage Map that do all of that. But specifically, when we're talking about within the church, these are the four that normally are going to be talked about. Right. So let's go ahead and actually set out and define what these are and what we actually need to do with them as far as... Mm -hmm what they look like, what we need to do with them. So we'll start with the one I can't pronounce because this is the one that is the topic mm. of most of the debate. Right. So what so, is it exactly? So newthetic counseling, uh, you know, if my understanding of this is correct, because this is not my wheelhouse, professional counseling is my wheelhouse, but newthetic counseling has to do with uh, strictly biblical counseling. Um where a, a counselor has been trained uh, to look at the scriptures and apply the scriptures to the specific problem area that's being presented in the counseling session. Uh, a newthetic counselor, um, at least the ones that I'm aware of, uh, essentially say that uh, that approach to counseling is, is all sufficient for whatever life challenges with which you're faced. Um, and we need and to, we probably need to make it clear. So we're throwing air quotes, quotes around biblical counseling with this as right. well, because part yeah. of what this actually is in practice, at least is it is a very specific reading of scripture that gets applied right. to everyday exactly. issues. Right. Right. It, it, and, and it comes out of a particular theological orientation, you know, whether it's uh, I'm sure you've heard of Bill Gothard um, and, and other individuals uh, that kind of take that approach. Of course, um, I, I know about Southern Baptist Theological Seminary here in Louisville, um, you know, essentially, you know, they have a biblical counseling program, um, but let's be honest, uh, it involves a, a particular reading of scripture or a particular interpretation of scripture and applying that uh, to the presenting problem in counseling. 
And it's um, one that, it's, like we said before, is driven much more by culture than theology. Yes, I, I, I would agree. I, I, I would say, so um, are there times in which if I'm doing therapy with a Christian and I know that this Christian uh, would welcome the integration of scripture into the therapeutic process, uh, I've learned over the years how to effectively do that, <clears throat> excuse me, how to effectively do that while at the same time uh, respecting the, the secular training that I've had um, and, and, and integrating scripture in such a way where people see that there is in fact a relationship between a biblical principle and a particular holistic. issue with which they're struggling. It's, it's a holistic approach. So, yeah. so my problem with nuthetic counseling uh, or what is tr traditionally referred to as biblical counseling is that it is a very narrow focus that is often having to do more with uh, cultural considerations as opposed to uh, what we might consider to be uh, theological considerations. And specifically Christocentric theology, especially, because it's not centered on Christ and the relationship in the Imago Dei and the holistic effect. It's specifically mm -hmm. dealing with most of the time, let's identify what sin has caused this. In many right, right. It, you, so you're, in, in, in essence, what you're doing is you, you're starting with the person uh, looking at deficits. Um, right. And one of the things that I've one of the things that I've learned uh, is that even when you look at how Jesus interacted with people, uh, he did not. Of course, he knew that everyone was a sinner and that that uh, their ultimate need was him. But by the same token, uh, he started out by acknowledging and affirming the dignity of that human person. Uh, he started out acknowledging and affirming the fact that this is a person of inherent worth and dignity uh, who had been created in the image of God. Uh, and therefore, uh, there are some positive aspects that can be used as foundational tools to get that person what they need. So um, Jesus and interacted with the Samaritan woman at the well, which was really culturally uh, reprehensible. Right. And, and this story in general is one that has been causing a lot of debate again online because you have some people that are claiming, well, this is a story where Jesus went in and told this woman to repent and look, she did it right away. But that's not the story. The story is Jesus went and sat down and never once even mentioned the word sin or repentance. Instead, he right. looked at this woman and said, what is it that you need? She wanted answers to her theology. Mm. She didn't care about any of the other stuff. She wanted to answer to theology, and that is what Jesus gave her. Mm -hmm. he, he looked at her mm -hmm. as a holistic person. Not what everybody else had already mm -hmm. labeled her as. Mm -hmm. He saw her how God saw her. Now, one of the things that comes up when the Nuthetic mm -hmm. stuff gets mentioned is that some people will say that that is the same thing as pastoral counseling. Mm -hmm. You've already made a distinction, at least in your talking. I make a very clear distinction in this as well, but I want to hear your distinction first. What's the difference between the Nuthetic approach and a pastoral approach to counseling. The pastoral approach is rooted in the gift of shepherding. Uh, the role of a shepherd is to care for flock. Pastor of a church, you could be maybe a ministerial team, an elder. You could, uh, or anyone can have the gifting, and anyone can be trained and uh, equipped to do pastoral counseling. Uh, if that is your area of gifting. Um, and so um, a, a pastoral counselor uh, simply looks after the needs of the flock, looks after the needs of the sheep. And so if the sheep breathing, 
uh, because of the death of someone, uh, then that pastoral counselor comes alongside the individual and assists them through that grieving process, right? Um, so I think when we talk about pastoral counseling, um, you know, it could uh, utilize the scriptures process, or it could be uh, simply uh, enough of resources around uh, the area of the church where you can make a referral, right? Pastoral counseling it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, give a person a, a magic scripture or anything as well. Uh, it, it is the, the, the overall thing and the overall uh, appointment of your church uh, to the task of caring for the needs of the flock. Uh, in some churches, deacons may do that, mm -hmm. right? In in other churches, you may have a uh, person of pastoral staff that may do that. So pastoral counseling uh, may look a bit different depending upon your context, uh, but it's simply for the purpose of assisting them through the daily life struggles that they're having. Uh, and those struggles could be spiritually based, uh, oracles could be emotionally based, but a good counselor is one who recognizes that they have limit, uh, particularly if they do not have any yes. professional training uh, in counseling. And so therefore, uh, they oftentimes are tasked with doing triage, determine whether or not a person needs a different level of care. And perhaps that level of care may come from secular society. Yeah, and that's where, you know, that that's the distinction that I normally make when we talk about these sort of things is the fact that, and this is part of, again, this is part of where the debate comes in as well, is that this is why mm -hmm. pastors should be known within their community and not just on a, oh, well, that's the pastor, but there needs mm -hmm. to be relationships and networking happening mm -hmm. within the community. So that way, when somebody comes to me and says they have a problem that I cannot help them with, I know the person down the street that can. Right. Right. And I also know that they're going to answer the phone mm -hmm. down the mm -hmm. street when I call them and tell them that this person is coming their way. You know, that is, that is what a pastoral counseling mm -hmm. looks like is it is like you said, it's about shepherding. It's not about me getting to build their insurance now. It's about mm -hmm. me helping them find what they need to get the help that they need so that they can be right. the person that God has created them to be. That's right. That's right. And, and I would say, this, Andrew, that um, a lot of the responsibility for people in the church continuing to wallow in their mental illness, I lay up that responsibility on uh, either the senior pastor or someone else on the pastoral team mm -hmm. whose ego is so big that they believe that they have what necessary to solve everybody's problem. And sometimes they can actually be a barrier to a person with mental illness actually getting the treatment that they need. Well, and that's only one part of it, because the other side of where this falls on the pastoral responsibility is the fact that part of the reason they may be wallowing is because of the fact that you have said from the pulpit something negative about what mental health actually is. That's not the case. You've identified it as sinful. You haven't identified it as a part of the fall that yep. Jesus has come to fix. And if Jesus has come to fix it, then what is the problem with you going to seek help for it? Right. You know, that this is, this is where, and right. this really is right. where we get into the big part of the discussion as far as how do we actually have this discussion within our churches? How do we have a discussion about mental health mm -hmm. in a positive, holistic, mm -hmm. Christocentric way mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. our churches when the church culture is mm -hmm. completely identified themselves with the cultural attitude? about it that is not anything that is biblical or even medically accurate? How do we have these mm -hmm. discussions? Well, I, I think we have the discussion uh, by starting with the process of unlearning some things. Unfortunately, uh, uh, with American Christianity, 
there is so much junk and cultural baggage that we have to unlearn that has been taught by a pastor whom we've respected. Mm -hmm. Uh, And hear me, you know, I'm pro pastor. Uh, I'm not here to down pastors. I'm a pastor myself. However, let's face it, uh, that pastors oftentimes can be used to be purveyors of misinformation or disinformation. Uh, I'm not even going to get into the issue. That's a whole nother issue. <laughs> you know, you get past during the pandemic, you know, because they were on Facebook or on the internet that they became, uh, you know, lay scientists, you know, and they could advise people about, you know, is a mask necessary or is it not, you know? And, and so there's so much misinformation, disinformation that comes from the, it comes through the mouth of the senior pastor or the teaching pastor. So then what, what is the best step in terms of even addressing it? Because this is part of the issues you're going to, that we run into, especially in churches where we have pastors that have given themselves the role of the counselor. Maybe not even some, because some of the times mm-hmm. it's, it's just out of necessity. They've been asked. And so they feel the best way to help the flock is to do it. But in other places, we have people where mm-hmm. they have forced themselves into the position. How do we have that kind mm-hmm. of discussion as far as saying, hey, you mm-hmm. know what? This is not actually correct. Where are you getting your sources from? Because this is what mm-hmm. most recognized sources are saying. Mm-hmm. How do we, and this is something that doesn't even have to come up with the mental health side of this. Like you said, this is across the board in many different places. How do we have this kind of discussion of saying, mm-hmm. Pastor, mm-hmm. maybe we need to take a second and look at this? Yeah. So a lot of it starts with leadership. So, you know, I, I prayerfully am going to say this, that there are pastors out there who have the humility to say, I don't have everything that our people need. And I need to consult with mental health professionals uh, to get some guidance in terms of how I triage people and, and the problems that they're addressing uh, and in what situations is a referral necessary. Um, mm-hmm. And there are a number of Christians who are in uh, these disciplines, whether it's social work, psychology, you know, licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, so in every, in every major urban setting, and in rural settings, often there are Christians uh, who are equipped professionally and academically in these areas that pastors and other church leaders can consult with. Um, the, the other piece is this, uh, and and maybe this is not the direction in which you want it to go, but I would dare say that a number of our pastors and church leaders they need to be in therapy themselves. Uh, right. They right. have unresolved issues themselves, and I think that um, pastors and church leaders who have themselves submitted themselves to the process of receiving professional help, they're in a prime position then to disseminate correct information to the flock. Uh, They're in the position to set the example. uh, And that's why I'm very transparent with my church. My church knows I have a psychiatrist. My church knows that I've been in therapy uh, and, and, and we have been able to destigmify uh, or destigmatize uh, the issue of mental illness because I've led the way in that in that area. And and even when I refer to mental health in my preaching, it is done in such a way where people understand that this is a normal area of life. That that if my pastor uh, is willing to seek professional help. Uh, then obviously he does not think anything's wrong with it. So therefore, I have the permission structure, if you will, to seek the help that I need. Right. And and to clarify there, even though I don't know that anybody's going to have this thought, but because of how the internet is, he's not saying that you have to have the pastor's permission to go do this. But he is saying Correct. that, he's saying that, again, this is part of breaking down the stigmas that have come out of the church where you have pastors saying you don't have permission to go do this. 
And that yes, is where you know, that's where the issue lies. Right now, right. You know, and, 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 and let me let me jump in there and say the, the the Bible does teach certain things about pastoral authority. But many of the things that we're seeing in the church is not what the Bible is teaching. Uh, rather, it is spiritually abusive. And, right. and so I, I think I think it's rather hypocritical uh, for a pastor to give people carte blanche to uh, seek whatever medical treatment they need if they have cancer. But all of a sudden, when it comes to a mental illness, they want to micromanage their members and say, well, no, you can't go here. You can't go there. Uh, that's spiritually abusive. You know, yeah. and so a lot of things, a lot of things that are done under the guise of, quote unquote, pastoral authority or biblical authority is actually not of the scripture, not of Christ. It is spiritual abuse. And that's what, you know, we talked about this back when we covered biblical authority back earlier this season. The word authority is never actually associated with the word pastor in scripture. Pastors mm. are representatives of the authority that Christ has because Christ has all authority. So the authority that is being wielded by a pastor mm -hmm. should be redirecting people back to a holistic approach to who Christ is. And mm -hmm. Christ is one that cared for the health of the people that was around him. You know, mm -hmm. even when, even when he was being arrested and Peter lops off the servant's ear, Jesus takes the time to heal that servant's ear. Mm-hmm. Because their health mattered because they were made in God's image. And so that is what gives mm -hmm. them their worth and their dignity. So, yes. Joel, we are out of time for this one. This was a somewhat watered down, but not so watered down talk on mental health. Uh, if you want a deeper discussion on mental health, especially related to the African-American community, um, if you look in either Joel or Brian Hudson's guest portals, you'll be able to find a link to a discussion the two of them had. That was a little bit more in depth in that that area of it. Um, you also can can check out some of his other writings and other guest appearances, other places at his website, acompellingvoice.com. Um, that's also linked in his guest porter, portal, all that good stuff, as well as um, a couple of his sermons and things like that. Um, for those of you that are Patreon members, assuming that we get the internet working well enough to continue to do this. Um, there will be an episode releasing here soon with, with Joel going one step further in this discussion as far as how Christians should approach the gun discussion surrounding mental health. Um, that'll be coming up here soon. Um, speaking of Patreon, it's still November for a little bit here. So anybody that is joining Patreon now, if you guys join now, it is giving month, which means that your money will not just go to help misfits, but also towards Tikva um, and the work that Tikva is doing in our community. In a lot of ways, dealing with some of the stuff we talked about today, as far as giving the mental health needs and referrals that are needed for our kids. Um, you can check out all that at patreon.com backslash ministry misfits. You also, uh, don't want to miss out because starting December 13th, the 12 days of misfits are back. Brandon and I are going to do another 12 days of me messing with his mind and testing his, his biblical and this year caroling knowledge and seeing if he can figure out where some of these different carols come out of our Bible. So Joel, stay with me for a minute. We will be recording here in a second. The rest of you, we will see you all hopefully next week. If not, we will see you in December. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Ministry Misfit Media in association with Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers, and Brandon Simmons is associate producer. The Ministry Misfits theme song is written and produced by J.D. Laird and Laird Creative Agency. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com or by following at Ministry Misfit on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also visit our website at www.ministrymisfits.com or through bio.link backslash Ministry Misfits. If you would like to support Ministry Misfits, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com backslash ministry misfits.